the 22nd, 1941, Hitler launches Operation Barbarossa, his invasion of the Soviet Union. An ill-equipped Russian air force is caught off guard. But within two years, aircraft like the Yak-3 fighter turn the tide in what the Russians call the Great Patriotic War. This is the Yakovlev Yak-9. It was the ultimate form of an aircraft that was designed in 1939 to satisfy an official requirement for a new generation of Russian single-seat combat aircraft. As the great patriotic war dragged on, these Yakovlev fighters evolved into an effective opponent for the Luftwaffe's legendary Messerschmitts and focke Wolfs. Alexander Yakovlev's original design was promising. It made its public debut in the 1940 May Day flypast, while Russia was still basking in the false security of Stalin's non-aggression pact with Hitler. But a year later, on the eve of Operation Barbarossa, Hitler's surprise attack on Russia, the Yak fighters were still not in full production. Most Russian fighter aircraft were outmoded designs, and Russia was about to be invaded again. In Russia, the recollection and commemoration of the experience of war is part of the way of life. On Kutuzovsky Prospect, the western gateway to Moscow, there is a victory arch that dates from the Napoleonic Wars of the early 1800s. It celebrates Mother Russia's victory over Napoleon and symbolizes her ability to repel invaders from the West. Like Napoleon, Hitler saw Russia as a great prize, the answer to his problem of lack of living space or Lebensraum. He also saw Russia as a society ill-prepared for war against his own mighty forces, superbly equipped for battle on Russia's sweeping landscape and in the air above it. Hitler was right. Russia was ill-prepared. But he underestimated the spirit with which the Russian people would defend their vast motherland. This is a Soviet fighter pilot called Mikhailov, who, with his ammunition exhausted, sacrificed his life and his Yak-3 to bring down a German fighter. Fifty years on, stories of courage and sacrifice like his are still fresh in the minds of the Russians, and the uniquely Russian plains in which their parents and grandparents fought the air battles of the great patriotic war have themselves become legends. But in the early years, the Russian aircraft industry was slow to establish its own identity. Before the revolution of 1917, most of the scout or fighter aircraft of the Imperial Russian Air Force were Russian versions of French and British designs built under license. After the revolution, interest in aircraft waned as Lenin's Bolsheviks concentrated on establishing a new social order. But with the beginning of the Civil War, it became obvious that the Red Army needed air support, and on May Day 1918, aircraft were given a prominent place in the military parade. In December 1918, Nikolai Zhukovsky became the founding head of the Central Aero and Hydrodynamics Institute, known as Tsagi. Zhukovsky was the father figure of a group of young students of aeronautics, and Tsagi was to become the major center for Russian aviation research. It also developed some of the most talented designers and engineers in Russian aviation. The Red Air Force needed a workhorse and for convenience chose to copy the British de Havilland DH-9A. The Russian version was known as the R-1. R for Razvedchik, meaning reconnaissance. 
Most of the Russian aircraft produced in the 1920s were strongly influenced by British and German designs. But gradually, a new generation of bright young Soviet designers began to impose their ideas on the developing industry. Nikolai Polikarpov's special area of interest was fighter aircraft, but one of his first major successes was a reconnaissance design to replace the R-1. It was a simple biplane called the R-5. It entered service in 1930, and when production ended in 1937, 6,000 had been built. Another 1927 Polikarpov design for a basic trainer was to become a legend, although the first prototype would not even leave the ground. It was called the U-2, and like the R-5, was strong and simple. It served not only as a trainer, but as air ambulance, artillery spotter, even night bomber. It caused German infantry many sleepless nights in World War II. Female combat pilots, the night witches, would often cut their engines and glide their U-2s in behind German lines, dropping bombs on the sleeping troops. More than 40,000 U-2s were built. They were still a common sight in Russian skies many years after the end of the Great Patriotic War. Polikarpov's fortunes in the late 1920s were mixed. Uh, he was commissioned to design a fighter, but his progress was considered slow, so he was imprisoned and sentenced to be shot. Uh, the sentence was never carried out. In 1933, he regained political favor and produced two fighter designs. The I-15 was a streamlined biplane with excellent performance, but the second design, the I-16, was revolutionary. In an era of biplanes, it was a low-winged monoplane with retractable landing gear, the first fighter of this kind to enter service anywhere in the world. It had a maximum speed of 283 miles an hour, which was very fast for that period. By 1935, the I-16 was arriving in numbers in Red Air Force fighter squadrons. And over the next two years, several improved versions were introduced. Stalin was so pleased with the I-16 that he presented Polikarpov with a personal limousine and the Order of Lenin. The I-16 was not easy to handle. Its takeoff and landing speeds were fast. It tended to spin viciously in tight turns, Red Air Force pilot said that if you could fly an I-16, you could fly anything. When the Spanish Civil War broke out in 1936, the wooden-framed I-16 was the Red Air Force's premium fighter. Improvements had taken the design as far as it could go. At first, it was successful fighting on the side of the Republicans who called it Mosca, the fly. But then it encountered an enemy that belonged to a new generation. The German Messerschmitt BF-109, with its sleek lines and powerful inline engine, was fighting for the Condor Legion of Hitler's nationalist allies. The result of the encounter was clear. The I-16, known to the fascist nationalists as the Rat, was all but finished. Stalin had been a champion of the development of the I-16. It suited his philosophy of sticking with the proven and familiar. But when it failed against the Messerschmitt, it fell from grace with Stalin, and so did Polikarpov. Unlike many other designers of the period, Polikarpov was not executed 
in Stalin's savage purges of the military, but in effect his career was over. In early 1939, several young aircraft designers were asked to submit proposals for new fighter designs. Alexander Yakovlev was a man on the way up. He began his career as a mechanic at Moscow's Central Airfield in the late 1920s. In 1939, he was 33 years old, had a reputation as a ladies' man and driver of fast cars. He was also in favor with Stalin, having recently designed two successful trainers, the UT-1 and UT-2. The Yakovlev Bureau was considered to have a virtual monopoly in the design of light aircraft, and it now made a strong bid to assume the mantle that had so long been worn by Polykarpov, leadership in the design of high-performance fighters. Throughout 1939, the Yakovlev Bureau worked on the development of a new design that would be competitive with the German Messerschmitt. But whether it would be ready to fight when Stalin's inevitable war with Hitler began was another question. As design work proceeded and Germany was plunging into war in Europe, Stalin signed a non-aggression pact with Hitler, buying time that had to be well used by the designers of war materials. The full resources of TAGI, the Central Aero and Hydrodynamics Institute, were used to test the concept and refine the layout of the I-26, as the new prototype was called. By late 1939, design and construction work was complete and in January 1940, it flew for the first time. It went into limited production almost immediately, designated Yak-1. In the meantime, Soviet air power received another public defeat in the winter war against Finland in late 1939. Obsolete Russian heavy bombers failed to immobilize the Finns, and the Red Air Force lost almost a thousand aircraft compared with less than a hundred lost by the Finns. The poor Russian showing was not unnoticed by Hitler. By late 1940, in spite of his non-aggression pact with Stalin, Hitler's generals were planning Operation Barbarossa, his invasion of the Soviet Union. German intelligence estimated that given Stalin's purges and Russian losses in Spain and Finland, it would take four years for the Red Air Force to rebuild to its 1937 strength. In Russia, the rebuilding was already beginning, and one of its major components was an abundant Russian resource, wood. The Yak-1 had wooden wing frames but another new fighter, the Lavochkin LAGG-1, was built almost completely of wood. Its skin was made of layers of wood laminated with fiberglass. It was very strong, but heavy and underpowered, and pilots called it Lakirovany Garantirovany Grob, or Guaranteed Varnished Coffin. The third bureau involved in fighter design in 1939 was run by a partnership between Artyom Mikhayan and Mikhail Gurevich. Their MiG design bureau was to become a legend in Russian aviation. Their prototype fighter, the I-200, was designed and built in just four months. It entered production in 1940 and became known as the MiG-1. In this parade celebrating Soviet youth in August 1939, there was little hint of a threat of coming war. But many of these young people from the 12 Soviet republics would be dead within two years, and millions of Soviet children would be without parents. Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, declared war on Germany in September 1939. 
In America, Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the Neutrality Act, keeping America out of the war for the time being. Red Square, Moscow, November the 7th, 1940. Elite Soviet troops are reviewed by their commander, Marshal Timoshenko, in a traditional military ceremony. Timoshenko addresses his troops in the presence of Joseph Stalin and of high-ranking military officers. He tells his soldiers that the independence of the Soviet Union is in their hands. He says that the safety of the Soviet people, their houses, factories, collective farms and dams is their responsibility. If they're called on to use their weapons, they must use them well. Within five weeks, Hitler will issue his directive number 21, Operation Barbarossa, his plan to invade the Soviet Union. As the spring of 1941 took over from the cold of the Russian winter, life for ordinary Soviet citizens went on much as it had for hundreds of years, ruled by the rhythm of seasonal changes, far from considerations of war and turmoil. As the weather warmed, there was no inkling of the fact that a few hundred miles to the west, Germany was beginning to make moves towards invasion. Since December 1940, the Luftwaffe had been flying over Soviet territory on daily reconnaissance missions, but when Stalin was told, he ordered the Red Air Force to ignore them. By the spring of 1941, the sound of German aircraft in the skies above Russian territory went almost unnoticed. The German forces distributed a Russian language manual featuring phrases like hands up and surrender. Stalin ordered it to be ignored. Swarms of aircraft flew over Red Square on May Day, the 1st of May, 1941. They looked impressive, especially to ordinary citizens but Soviet military planners watching on that day knew well that most of the planes in the skies over the Kremlin were all but obsolete. In spite of the thrill they provided for the onlookers, they were no match for the superb equipment of the German Luftwaffe, which was already massing on the western borders of the Soviet Union. Early in June 1941, Soviet authorities received reports from Switzerland and Japan that Hitler was planning to invade Russia on June the 22nd. The information gave a precise account of the German battle order and its objectives. Soviet experts considered it too detailed to be true. On June the 18th, a German soldier deserted. He expected punishment for striking an officer. He not only confirmed the date of the invasion, but gave the hour it was due to begin, 3.55 a.m. Stalin said the information could not be trusted. At 3.15 on the morning of June the 22nd, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa. Many Russian air crews were on weekend leave and others were asleep. Within hours, Hitler appeared to have achieved his aim of putting the Soviet Air Force out of commission. Russian forces were confused. There was no immediate counter-offensive. Not until four hours after the attack was launched 
did Stalin order the Red Air Force to retaliate and destroy the enemy with powerful blows. Hitler could not believe the extent of his success. Luftwaffe chief Hermann Goering even ordered a recount of the Soviet planes destroyed. There were more than two and a half thousand. In the first month of Operation Barbarossa, the Luftwaffe claimed to destroy seven and a half thousand Soviet aircraft while losing only 770 of its own. But statistics can mislead. The Red Air Force had indeed lost almost 70% of its numbers, but the Luftwaffe's apparently smaller losses wiped out a devastating 60% of the planes available on the Eastern Front. In Washington, D.C., at the Soviet Embassy, Ambassador Umansky made a comment that must have seemed highly optimistic at the time. Hitler has miscalculated. Ours is a nation of a moral and political unity and strength unknown in the past. It is firmly organized, devoted to its leaders, and has utmost confidence in its armed forces which are ready for any test. Hitler's attack against my country will be smashed. The German forces advanced into Russia. In Moscow, the population waited, hearing daily news of the German progress, and then, in mid-July, when the way to Moscow stood open to the German army, Hitler made a decision that was to provide a reprieve for Stalin and the capital. He decided to consolidate the flanks of his army and postponed his advance on Moscow till the end of September. There were three bombing raids on Moscow in late July, but no great damage was inflicted. As Moscow prepared for attack, the Russian summer wore on into autumn and the weather cooled. Every passing day turned the situation a little more in favor of the Soviet capital. Reinforcements arrived in Moscow from Siberia and the Far East. In Russia, there is a period of heavy rain called Rasputitsa, uh, the season of bad roads. And as the Muscovites filled their sandbags and dug their defenses, it approached, apparently unconsidered by the German commanders. From the outskirts of the city to Red Square in the center, Moscow was placed on the defensive. People from surrounding areas streamed into the refuge of their capital. On September the 30th, as planned, Hitler launched Operation Typhoon, his advance on Moscow. By now, there were 600 fighter aircraft ready to defend the city, half of them the new Yaks, MiGs, and Lags. On October the 7th, the Rasputitsa struck. It rained, and by the afternoon, much of Hitler's forces were bogged down. Soviet aircraft could take off from their paved airstrips at will, but the Luftwaffe pilots found themselves stuck on muddy fields. The pilots defending the Moscow area were among the best in the Soviet Air Force. Some were test pilots from the design bureaus drafted into service. Luftwaffe fighter tactics in the early weeks of Barbarossa demonstrated that Soviet tactics were outmoded, and the Red Air Force pilots worked hard to develop new theories of aerial combat. What the Soviet pilots lacked in skill and tactical knowledge was to some extent compensated for by their fighting spirit and patriotic zeal. After the battle for Moscow, guards' air regiments would be created in which pilots took an oath saying, I swear to you, my country, and to you, my native Moscow, that I will fight relentlessly and destroy the fascists. With Moscow under threat of invasion, children were moved out and so were armament and aircraft factories. Factories were dismantled, transported behind the distant Ural Mountains, 
and rebuilt so that production of war materials could be resumed in safety. It was a project of immense size and hardship, most of it taking place in late autumn and winter. Alexander Yakovlev left Moscow for Novosibirsk in style. He drove a Pontiac, which he had to abandon for a train, and then a plane. When he reached the site of his new factory, he found problems with missing parts, and unfinished aircraft were buried under feet of snow. But with drive and improvisation, work continued, and three weeks after Yakovlev arrived, the first operational Yak-1 was rolled out. Those who arrived at the new factories had to cope with shortages of food, tools, and materials. But somehow, a year after the massive move, the factories behind the Ural Mountains were producing new military aircraft at the rate of 2,000 a month. Evolution of the fighters was rapid. Weight and drag were reduced in the Yak-1M. The Yak-3 was another step forward in performance. When the Yak-3 entered service in July 1943, it was superior to both the focke Wolf FW-190 and the Messerschmitt BF-109G at altitudes below 16,000 feet. In spite of the incredible achievement of moving the factories out and making them productive, Stalin was not satisfied. When the counteroffensive from Moscow began in late 1941, he saw a need for greater range for Soviet fighters and pressured the design bureaus to give it to him. That pressure passed down the line to the factories already working under impossible conditions. Many aircraft were delivered unfit to fly in combat and overtaxed ground crews were forced to do work that should, under normal circumstances, have been completed in the factory. Nevertheless, the new Yak fighters performed well. Pilots learned on the job and in master classes conducted by new fighter aces. One of their first tasks was to overcome a deeply ingrained fear of the Luftwaffe. Then they had to learn to fight on the dive and on the climb. They had to learn to use sun and cloud cover. They had to become more aggressive and determined so that they could use the great potential of their new thoroughbred high-performance machine. Growing aggression and skill among fighter pilots had to be tempered with prudence. By the summer of 1942, the number of new fighters available was still small. It was important to keep as many planes as possible flying while numerical strength built up. This is a Yak-3. In the original Yak-1, the pilot's canopy was not raised. The rear of the fuselage ran straight back from the top of the cockpit and pilot visibility was poor. The first major modification to the design was to cut down the rear fuselage and install a canopy with all-round vision. A two-seat trainer version, designated Yak-7V, performed so well that it was converted and fitted out as a night fighter with the designation Yak-7A. It's confusing that the Yak-7 appeared before the Yak-3 and the Yak-7V appeared before the Yak-7A, but that's the way it happened. The Yak-3 had a more powerful Klimov engine and a constant speed propeller. It was very maneuverable and considered to be an extremely formidable close combat fighter. The key to the success of Yaks was strength and simplicity. The Klimov engine was easy to maintain even under harsh field conditions. Cockpit instrumentation was simple. One Red Air Force colonel pointed out that there was no need to distract the pilot with a lot of fancy gadgets. 
From 1941 to 1945, more than 37,000 aircraft belonging to this family of fighters were produced. It was the most successful all-round Russian fighter of the Great Patriotic War. Artyom Mikoyan and Mikhail Gurevich's MiG design bureau was not as successful as Yakovlev in designing a fighter to meet the needs of aerial warfare over Russia and the Ukraine. The MiG-1 and MiG-3 were designed to perform well at high altitudes. They did, but unfortunately the realities of the Great Patriotic War called for lower altitude performance, and here the MiGs with their light airframe and large engine experienced handling difficulties. Also, they used the same engine as the Ilyushin Shturmovik, which was considered more important for the war effort and given priority. In the battle for Moscow, MiG-1s were available in greater numbers than the other new fighters, and they performed with distinction alongside the few yaks and lags available at the time. Later, they served with tactical reconnaissance squadrons, making better use of their speed and high-altitude capability. But one of Russia's greatest fighter pilots, Alexander Pakrishkin, loved the MiG-3. He used its high-altitude capability to develop a new approach to fighter tactics, closing the gap between the skills of Soviet pilots and those of the Luftwaffe. The MiG-3 was a major factor in developing his technique. He said, I decided the thing was to fight more boldly in a vertical plane. He would spot enemy formations from high altitude and dive down, attacking where they were weakest. Other Soviet pilots saw his results and followed his lead. Severe losses as the war dragged on forced radical changes in organization of the Air Force. In May 1942, General Alexander Novikov issued an edict. In the interest of increasing striking force, it is ordered to combine the air forces of the Western Front into a unified air army. The air armies were designed to be flexible enough to respond rapidly to changes in the strategic situation. While each was assigned to support its ground army front, Control and responsibility was placed in the hands of the Air Army commander. Losses of experienced pilots had been high, and new pilots were often briefly and inadequately trained. New controls were introduced. No pilot could break off from a dogfight without orders or abandon bomber escort duty. Forward observation stations were established on the ground just behind the front lines to provide radio guidance to fighter aircraft. Often, especially in cloudy conditions, these stations could track an enemy aircraft as it took refuge in cloud cover and relay an account of its movements to the pursuing Soviet pilot. An air army could be made up of divisions of fighter, ground attack aircraft and bombers. Bomber and Sturmovik divisions often had their own fighter regiments for escort and reconnaissance. As a result of the heavy losses of 1941 and 42, the size of fighter units was reduced. The new fighter regiments had 30 aircraft each, divided into three squadrons of 10. The 10 squadron members were subdivided into a pair made up of the leader and his number two, and two flights of four aircraft each. Regimental commanders and squadron leaders flew with their units and were expected to observe and monitor their new pilots. Even in 1943, Confidence was a problem for the inexperienced Russians. The reputation of the Luftwaffe was daunting for young men just out of a training program that was often inadequate. Their tendency to scatter under pressure made them easy targets for the experienced Germans, 
And in spite of reorganization and education, it remained a problem throughout the war. As the war continued into 1944, the Soviet fighter regiments gained a dominance over the Luftwaffe. It was largely numerical, brought about by the miracle of increasing production in the factories behind the Ural Mountains and mounting losses of Luftwaffe fighters that could not be replaced by German industry. In 1942, a new Russian fighter emerged to challenge the eminence of the Yaks. It was the Lavochkin LA-5, a direct descendant of the Lag-3, the guaranteed varnished coffin. The LA-5 was no guaranteed coffin. It was still largely wooden, but a new radial engine and some design modifications transformed it into an aircraft able to outperform new Messerschmitt and focke Wolf fighters at altitudes below 12,000 feet. In 1943, the LA-7 emerged. It was a redesigned and improved version of the LA-5FN and proved itself to be the most advanced Soviet fighter in the Great Patriotic War. Stalin was so impressed with its performance that he awarded Semyon Lavochkin a special prize of 100,000 rubles. The LA-7 had a radial engine that produced 1,800 horsepower, giving the aircraft a top speed of almost 420 miles an hour. There had been problems in development. In 1942, there were two incidents where the wings of LA-5s broke in flight. At first, there were rumors of sabotage, but eventually the problem was found to be worn drill bits. They drilled holes in the wing attachments too small to take the bolts. Assembly workers were using hefty hammer blows to force them in, and the structure was weakened and it failed under stress. The LA-7 was armed with two 23mm cannon located in the upper cowling. Hard points under the wings allowed armament loads of 330 pounds of bombs or six rockets. This is the aircraft flown by the top Russian ace of the Great Patriotic War, Ivan Khajidub. His career began in March 1943 in an LA-5, and he moved to the LA-7 in July 1944. He flew 520 sorties and had a total of 62 kills, including 22 Focke Wolfs and 19 Messerschmitts. By the end of the Great Patriotic War, over 200 Soviet pilots had each destroyed more than 20 German aircraft. Khajidub and the second-ranking Russian ace, Alexander Pakrishkin, were each awarded the gold star of the hero of the Soviet Union three times. Khajidub's record is remarkable because, as a brilliant instructor, he was held back from combat for a year and a half. At one point, he had 11 victories in 10 days. More than 10,000 Lavochkin LA-5FNs emerged from fighter plant number 21 at Gorky, east of Moscow. From 1944 onwards, reconstituted factories at Yaroslavl and Moscow turned out more than 5,000 LA-7s. The immense quantities of munitions to arm and support them poured from factories scattered out of reach of German bombers. But the Great Patriotic War was not fought without some external assistance. This is an American Bell P-63 King Cobra, delivered to Russia late in the war under the Lend-Lease program. Lend-Lease began in October 1941. The principal fighter aircraft supplied to the Russians was the Bell P-39 Aero Cobra. 
4,700 were delivered to the Soviet Union via Alaska and Siberia in the course of the war. The Aracobra was not popular with American pilots because of its poor high-altitude performance, but the Soviet pilots found that it performed well as a low-altitude fighter. Its 37mm cannon made it an effective ground attack aircraft, and it had excellent radio communication. Russian authorities have tended to downplay the effect of Lend-Lease as a factor in Soviet victory, but among fighter aircraft, and especially early in the war, it was important. In 1943, after more than two years of desperate struggle under conditions of extreme hardship, the Soviet Union took the upper hand in the Great Patriotic War. The influence of fighter aircraft in the eventual Soviet victory has to be seen in the context of the overall military effort. Fighters supported bombers and Sturmovik raids in the air and infantry and artillery efforts on the ground. They took part in dogfights, and they helped enforce blockades of areas under German control. The fact that Russian fighter aircraft in such a sorry state of obsolescence in 1939 could evolve so quickly and become so competitive with their superb German opponents by the middle years of the war is one of the extraordinary aspects of the Soviet military recovery. This is the Yakovlev Yak-9, the final point of evolution of the Yak fighters during the Great Patriotic War. It was a development of the Yak-7 and responded to Stalin's demands to his fighter designers for longer range. To achieve this, Yakovlev sacrificed the wooden construction of the wings. Instead of wood, the wing spars were made of lightweight metal, and this allowed larger fuel cells to be installed within the wing structure. Cannon fired through the propeller shaft, and the aircraft also carried either one or two machine guns. The Yak-9 was ready in time to take part in the Battle of Stalingrad, where fighting alongside the new Lavochkin LA-5, it became a major new factor in the aerial war. All Russian fighter aircraft used wood in some part of their construction until 1944, when the Yak-9U, with an all-metal airframe, was introduced. It was to remain the only Soviet fighter aircraft of the war with no wooden components. Of the 37,000 Yakovlev fighters built during the Great Patriotic War, 17,000 were Yak-9. There were many variants, including fighter-bomber, long-range fighter, night interceptor, reconnaissance, and trainer versions. Each one maintained the simplicity and robust strength that had made the Yak-1 a success from the time it first flew. The Yak-9 was a perfect culmination of Stalin's preference for simplicity and quantity over technological refinement. The Yak-9 was not necessarily the fastest of the Yaks. Its greater fuel load was gained at the loss of some outright performance. The Yak-1M and the Yak-3 with their lighter construction, were considered to be the high-performance air superiority aircraft. The Yak-7 and Yak-9 were battlefield fighters. These two lines of evolution gave the Yaks greater flexibility of operation than any other Soviet fighters. 
Alexander Yakovlev was honored by Stalin at the end of the war for his contribution to the war effort. So were the other major design bureau heads, not all of whom admired Yakovlev. Some felt that he used his position as deputy head of the aircraft industry and access to Stalin's ear to promote his own interests. It seems likely that he had a hand in ensuring the end of Nikolai Polikarpov's career and the close of his design bureau after his death. But at least he had the skill to survive in the atmosphere of paranoia and terror cultivated by Stalin and under adverse conditions produce one of the most effective fighter aircraft of World War II. This is another Yakovlev single-seater aircraft. It is a Yak-55 a distant descendant of the Yak fighters of World War II. It's one of the finest aerobatic aircraft in the world, performing maneuvers that would have been unthinkable for any World War II fighter. Russian pilots have a passion for aerobatics, developing and building on the skills established by their parents and grandparents in the fighter aircraft of the Great Patriotic War. The best of the Russian aerobatic pilots have a great international reputation, and many of them, including the one flying this plane, are women. The name of Yakovlev is no longer prominent as a designer of air superiority fighters, but the little Yak-55 recalls days of glory when Yak-1s, 7s and 9s flew to victory in the Great Patriotic War. <laughs> 